Uh, I'm Adam Szymanski with Deutsche Bank. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the outside uh, senior advisors here at uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. So I'm uh, happy to kind of make that dual role work here today uh, because I've also been uh, a pretty active member of the National Capital Area Chapter of the U.S. Association for Energy Economics. And so it's, uh, it's great to have this joint CSIS-NCAC uh, meeting. Uh, today, uh, at, we're very privileged to have uh, Commissioner Mark uh, Spitzer from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with us. Uh, the bio is in your pack. Uh, you know, it starts off with his work at the, at the FERC. Uh, but I wanted to actually go down to the bottom and, and work my way back up to the top in introducing Commissioner Spitzer. He was born in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, and grew up in Philadelphia. I like that. I'm from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And uh, graduated from Dickinson College and then went on to the University of Michigan Law School. I guess it would be an interesting thing to know in the Spitzer uh, living room who he roots for when Penn State is playing Michigan. <laughs> And maybe the answer is, since he moved to Arizona in 1981, because he had family there, uh, that he was really rooting for Arizona in that, in that uh, basketball game just the other day. And it's really too bad, I thought. I thought that was an unbelievable performance of that team, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> during the, uh, he uh, acted as a, an attorney uh, in Arizona for some time during the 19. Uh, 90s, he was actually elected and held office in the Arizona Senate. In uh, the year 2000, he was elected to the Arizona Corporation Commission, and a couple of years later was uh, elected by his fellow commissioners to serve as the chairman of uh, the ACC. Uh, in Arizona, he uh, focused on grid access for alternative energy and advancing consumer privacy and telecommunications, which I think is kind of interesting because we're going to talk a little bit about that later in terms of the grid and concerns that people have about uh, privacy and the smart grid. Uh, well, in uh, 2006, uh, Mark was uh, nominated by uh, President George W. Bush to uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and he was, of course, approved by the U.S. Senate. He came to the FERC with a view emphasizing safe, economic, and reliable supplies of energy for consumers and robust, transparent, and competitive markets for suppliers. Uh, I think that uh, those uh, are clearly the right goals on both sides of, of buying and, and selling in the energy markets. And uh, again, very pleased to have Commissioner Mark Spitzer with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, daunting to be speaking in front of energy economists, given I, I don't have a background in, in economics. I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer and a recovering politician, and I, I don't apologize uh, for either. And I guess with the, with the leave of the chair, I'm going to come down. I, podium's kind of a distant thing. Trying a case and a juror won't look at you. You've got a problem with that juror. <laughs> Similarly, with the with the voter, uh, I think it's great for those who care about energy uh, and for the consumers of energy in the United States and across the world who are increasingly caring about energy. Thank you very much. That um, we have the president of the United States addressing energy. Uh, this morning, uh, and greater focus and debate uh, on the consequences of the production and consumption of energy uh, throughout the world uh, at no time uh, in history has, I think, we've had this attention to the issue. So it's a great time to be involved in energy policy, uh, and I have the great honor and privilege of uh, serving the ratepayers of the United States. Uh, a little bit about uh, FERC. Uh, unlike some other agencies uh, in Washington in this town where there's been some discord and some acrimony, uh, FERC is a wonderful place to work. Uh, Sarah, can, if she has a contrary view, can, can so state. Uh, 
she's been there a lot longer than I. Uh, I can tell you though that um, there there are several I think roots in 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 the uh, collegiality of the institution. One is the nature of energy law. It has historically not been partisan, and if you look at the deliberations in energy uh, historically. Uh, there has been consensus and bipartisanship, and virtually every piece of energy legislation going back to the 1930s with hydropower and the formation of the Federal Power Commission, uh, the creation of FERC in the 1970s, uh, interest in competition uh, and energy markets in natural gas and electricity in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, respectively, uh, had their origins in bipartisan legislation. And I think that has interesting consequences, the fact that we've had competitive energy markets in gas, starting with the wellhead decontrol in 1982 and leading to the unbundling of the pipeline system, uh, electricity uh, with uh, Phil Sharp's legislation uh, in 1992, the Energy Policy Act, FERC Order 888, which opened up the transmission grid to competition uh, as the PURPA uh, in the 1970s opened the generation market to competition, was, su was supported in a bipartisan way by Congress and the White House and successive FERC administrations, whether they be Republican or Democrat. And I think that's an interesting uh, and, and noteworthy consequence. I, I don't want to pick on other agencies, but I have to say as a, as a practicing lawyer, uh, where an agency such as NLRB, uh, the Republican appointees tend to be pretty hardcore uh, management side advocates. The Democratic appointees uh, tend to be pretty hardcore union advocates, uh, and the case is going to be decided based upon the proclivities, union versus management, as opposed to where I was trained as the facts, you apply the facts of the case to the law. Uh, that's demoralizing to, to attorneys who practice. You know, do you give your full effort uh, to a case where you know it's preordained because there's a 3-2 majority that's either pro-labor or pro-management. It's also very corrosive to the folks inside the building. Uh, our, you know, I, I, my team works very hard. Uh, you know, sometimes I have to say, you you work for the government, you can't be staying until 8 o'clock every night here. Uh, but they're very dedicated folks, and they are throughout the building. Uh, and I think they know that, that the, the, each issue is treated uh, on the merits. Uh, and it is corrosive and negative, uh, not only for those inside the process, but the, for those who are affected by the deliberations where the disputes and debates are not r rendered on the merits of the case. And at FERC, they are. And virtually every major decision that FERC has issued, certainly since I've been there, but going back to the unbundling of the natural gas infrastructure system and the unbundling of the electric grid in the 1980s and 1990s, Every decision was unanimous, and it didn't matter whether it was a Republican or Democrat administration or Republican or Democrat chair of the FERC, and that has continued. I've served under Joe Kelleher as chairman, now under John Wellinghoff as chairman, one a Republican, the other a Democrat, and the orders have continued to be unanimous. And the theory is, I think, very significant, that FERC speaks loudest when it speaks with one voice. We are asking individuals and companies to reorder their affairs. These investments are 30 to 40 year assets. These investments are now into the trillions of dollars and it's very important that there be certainty and predictability uh, and that arises best when we know that an election is not gonna overturn the result because it was a bipartisan consensus. I give a stump speech where for a number of years I've talked about uh, the three-legged stool of markets, infrastructure, and rule of law. And I believe it's very important to stand up for what you believe in. I got a little lesson from this, and we at the lunch table we were talking about folks from Tucson, Arizona. So I'll give a little Tucson anecdote. Uh, in 1984, I was a very young lawyer in Phoenix, and I got a phone call. I was sitting at my desk at the law firm. How would you like to debate against Morris Udall? It's a great opportunity for you. I said, okay. Uh, why? You know, he, he was running for re-election to the U.S. House. Most of his district was in Tucson. But through the vagaries of redistricting and reapportionment, there was a small sliver of Phoenix that was now in his district. So he was coming up to visit and coming up to debate. And the answer I received as to why I was asked as a young lawyer to debate Morris Udall was the Republican nominee was a schmuck. <laughs> so 
What I like to debate more is Udall. So I, I show up at the Jewish Community Center in, uh, in Central Phoenix on, on Maryland Avenue. And uh, I start out, I had my prepared remarks, and I was, you know, gave my pitch. And uh, Mo Udall cut me to shreds in about five minutes. And I agonized the rest of that debate. It was the longest 90 minutes I'd ever endured, just getting the hell out of, beat out of me by an icon, uh, a statesman, who, by the way, a few years earlier, came within two points of defeating Jimmy Carter in the New Hampshire primary. And the world would, might have turned out quite differently had, had Mo Udall been elected president in 76 instead of Carter. And we, d we don't know what would have happened. But, uh, and of course, you had Goldwater and you had McCain. They, n none of them did so hot uh, <laughs> in their races. And uh, Udall was the one who, you know, of course, fa famous for his wit. Uh, and this is before, obviously, uh, before the McCain election, said uh, Arizona is the only state in the union where parents cannot tell their children they can grow up to be president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> After the debate, I was just crestfallen. My head was down. And a throng of folks you know, who didn't normally see Mo Udall up in Phoenix can, came to the podium to congratulate him. Uh, and he parted the adoring multitudes and went over to where I was seated despondently and shook my hand and said, young man, right now I know you, your dauber's down a little bit, uh, but I, I do think you have a future in politics. I don't know whether he's right or wrong about that. And more importantly, he said to me, you need to keep plugging away at this and never, ever lose the courage to stand up for what you believe in. And, you know, a few years later, you know, Mo got uh, the Parkinson's that ultimately claimed his life. But he was uh, an icon, and there are institutions across the country, and particularly at the University of Arizona, dedicated to his legacy of environmental stewardship, uh, per particularly in the Western, the beauty of the Western United States. But I've kept with me his admonition to stand up for what I believe in. And what I believe in at FERC is what I've said in my interview with the White House. I would act on and I would believe in, which is markets, infrastructure, and rule of law. And in terms of these, in terms of these issues, uh, energy markets, I believe that uh, markets consistent with the FERC policies on natural gas and electricity uh, send price signals and lead to the best economic outcomes rather than government micromanagement. And the FERC policies have been to open markets and competitive outcomes. Uh, you need infrastructure. You need to have steel in the ground. I was an elected commissioner in Arizona. I had to site power plants and transmission lines in people's backyards, including Gilbert, Arizona. We were talking about a case, the Santan case in Gilbert. And uh, when you site power plants and transmission lines in people's backyards, it pisses them off. And I had to ask for their votes at the general election following my decisions to site infrastructure. Uh, but it is essential that we have energy infrastructure of all kinds uh, in this country, uh, and without a robust infrastructure system, we fail to bring the benefits of markets to the ratepayers. And in terms of the benefits of markets, I s include environmental benefits as well as economic benefits. And then finally, the issue of rule of law. There has to be settled law. Uh, a 5-0 decision is, is good settled law. A 3-2 Republican versus Democrat decision where the next election could flip the result is unsettled law. It's also unsettled law where uh, the federal agencies do not uphold sanctity of contract. And we saw a number of cases arising out of the California energy crisis that predated my tenure at FERC, where uh, entities, uh, and I'm not talking about the fraudulent issues reg regarding Enron, those can be addressed. And a fraudulent contract, uh, as a lawyer knows, is void ab initio. In other words, it didn't, it didn't exist. Not, it's not voidable at the option of a party, it's void. Uh, I'm talking about contracts between a willing buyer and a willing seller, and for whatever reason, one of the parties gets buyer's remorse post hoc and tries to avoid the contract, and that is inconsistent with the framework in which we're trying to have certainty and stability and, and, and in, embrace investment, uh, and trillions of dollars in 30 to 40-year assets will flee if there is not sanctity of contract. And in 2008, the Supreme Court issued a decision arising from FERC orders called Morgan Stanley, 
and there have been subsequent decisions, and it's, a, it's an arcane technical doctrine. It's actually called the Mobile Sierra Doctrine, named after a gas case, an electric case from the 1950s. But the concept is to uphold sanctity of contract, which is, which is essential. I had a law partner from, from Arizona who traveled to Ukraine uh, in, uh, right after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, and he was asked, because he was fluent in Ukrainian, his wife was in fact bilingual, uh, to go to Ukraine and draft the commercial code for Ukraine. He was an outstanding commercial lawyer and a scholar and an academic and someone who had great affinity for, uh, for the Ukrainian people. But it quickly became evident to him in terms of his drafting the uniform commercial code for Ukraine that where there was anarchic circumstances where the courts were either corrupt or unable or unwilling to enforce a bilateral contract between a buyer and seller of goods or services that commerce could not exist. And notwithstanding the most wonderful code that he could write, if we didn't have rule of law, we didn't have commerce, and we didn't have uh, society as we know it. So I, I, I am. Uh, it was wonderful to hear the oral arguments, both in the Morgan Stanley case and the Maine uh, Public Service Commission case. Uh, in both, uh, FERC's orders were affirmed. My, not my well, Maine P PSC was 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 our orders. Uh, the Morgan Stanley case uh, was was from the uh, 01, 02, 03 energy crisis, but the 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 test of sanctity of contract has stood the test of time, and these were unanimous decisions from the United States Supreme Court. So again, they didn't hinge on on politics or uh, political preferences, but instead on a vast underpinning of rule of law that obviously appeals to me as a member of the bar. Uh, so where we have markets, infrastructure, rule of law aligned, we have good results. Now, I understand last year there, there was uh, attention paid to the issue of shale, the natural gas. Let's explore the relationship between the shale revolution and the Mark Spitzer three-legged stool. Uh, markets, uh, price signals have been sent. Uh, of course, wellhead decontrol arose in 1982. Uh, the markets respond to price signals the price signals were sent in 2008, and the result of the price signals, as always happens when we allow markets to efficiently operate, is there is technological innovation. And the technological innovation, of course, was horizontal and directional drilling, was the fracturing, and assuming that the appropriate environmental standards are met and they should be enforced. And I'm, uh, as a Pennsylvania native like, like Adam, uh, uh, I'm proud uh, that the, the former governor, uh, Rendell, who was a Democrat, said, uh, I want to produce natural gas in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the benefit of Pennsylvanians. I want to protect the environment uh, of Pennsylvania and ensure that the roads are safe, that the water is safe, and that all of the environmental standards and laws are adhered to. Uh, and he had a fairly aggressive DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, director, uh, who was uh, prepared to enforce the law, and I'm sure his successors will as well. Uh, so you can have both, and you need, we need to have both, both protect the environment and uh, produce the energy uh, in, this, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and throughout the country. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, we have a good outcome, uh, a good environmental outcome. Uh, there, uh, there, there's been quite a bit of discussion of, of natural gas displacement of coal uh, for both economic and environmental reasons. Uh, and it was the operation of market signals the, that caused this result. Now, we have to have infrastructure. And the siting of electric transmission is quite a bit different than the history of the siting of natural gas infrastructure. Uh, siting of electricity is largely done by the states. Uh, Congress attempted to create a federal backstop in uh, 2005. There were some, I think, aberrant decisions from two separate sets of uh, courts of appeal in the, in the country, the Fourth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, that have impaired that backstop siting authority. But in the area of natural gas, there's no question, going back to 1935, that authority uh, has resided in the FERC to site natural gas infrastructure. And what FERC did was site more miles of interstate natural gas pipelines and more uh, compression areas uh, throughout the country and more natural gas storage facilities than any time in the history of this country. In response, to the market signals that were sent, FERC stood, stood up and built the infrastructure necessary to get the gas supplies to market, to the point that I was asked to speak at a dedication of a natural gas pipeline facility in Louisiana, and uh, the t television folks came down for a TV interview from Shreveport, 
uh, through FERC's pre-filing process, which allows the stakeholders to meet and confer prior to a filing to work out environmental issues, to meet with the government officials, to meet with the city and, and local authorities and the environmental protection agencies of the various states, to resolve issues and determine the best route and the best means to construct the project, uh, we were able to get this completed in nine months. So I'm being interviewed by the Shreveport TV folks as to the e efficacy and efficiency of the federal government, which you don't hear all that often, uh, especially down south, where you know Yankees may not be uh, held in great esteem. But in this case, they recognize that FERC had worked with the stakeholders uh, to get a very good result. Uh, and as a consequence, a uh, very low cost shale gas from uh, the Barnett Shale and the Fayetteville Shale were finding their way into uh, the uh, markets of the eastern United States to the enormous benefit of the ratepayers of this country. Uh, in Arizona, when we had Hurricane Katrina, natural gas prices spiked. Uh, I was on a commissioner who had to raise rates for natural gas uh, distribution companies, as well as for the electric companies that had gas index uh, charges. And it was a, a difficult and painful process, particularly for an elected commissioner. And I used to study the basis differentials between the delivery points in Arizona and the production points. And they were measured in four, five, six dollar increments. The basis differentials across the country because of shale and because FERC doing its job citing natural gas infrastructure has caused those basis differentials to collapse. Okay, we have a great success story. We need to apply that analogy that was so successful in the area of natural gas to the area of electricity. Now there are some real challenges because the historical derivation of, of electricity regulation is different than natural gas. I'll pose, I guess, a uh, two major hurdles and then and hopefully pose some solutions, talk about what FERC has been doing on some of these areas that I've posed the solutions and then leave some time for questions. In terms of the challenges, uh, there is still a segment that disputes the notion that electricity is a commodity. You know, it sounds uh, facetious, but if you look at the history of regulation, where the local distribution companies in natural gas were never, I, I think, treated as the proprietary interest of the local city or town, uh, in electricity, uh, and you talk to state regulators who have been parties to merger or acquisition transactions, many folks feel that there's uh, some local vested proprietary interest in the distribution company, and therefore there is a resentment when electrons move across state boundaries, uh, contrary to the laws of physics. Um, we had a number of proceedings in Oregon, and uh, particularly with hydropower, there are some Oregonians that just feel it is an absolute travesty for an electron produced by hydropower in the Pacific Northwest to go to California. And, and it's a... Uh, I understand that they, they have issues with Californians up in Oregon, uh, but you've got a, a sort of a fundamental analytical block here that creates, and people always talked about the power grid being balkanized, and that's, I think, an insult to the Macedonians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are, 2,000 owners, operators, or users of the bulk electric system in this, in this country. It is the, the multitude of entities uh, has, has seriously eroded our ability to deliver the most affordable and most environmentally friendly resource to the ratepayers. Now, I'm a, I'm a states' rights guy, okay? I was four times elected to the Arizona legislature, twice Arizona commission. And I moved to Washington, D.C. I still root against the Redskins, okay? So I've not gotten Potomac fever, and I'm certainly not one who believes that all the wisdom of the world resides in Washington, D.C. And I'm extremely respectful of the states, particularly in areas uh, of uh, RPS. I think sometimes the states are more advanced, and the states will lead the federal government rather than, rather than follow. Uh, that being said, uh, if we treat electricity as other than a commodity that is purely a function of state regulation. Uh, I think, I think we, we, we will encounter difficulties in getting the best results that we can and results such as I've described in the area of, uh, in the area of natural gas. Uh, the second issue 
it's related to the first in terms of the electricity, whether we agree or disagree that it's a commodity, uh, is the issue of parochialism. Um, there is increasingly a uh, discussion of states using electricity generation to create jobs. Now, I understand that, and I don't, I don't dismiss the term politician. Number one, I was a politician, and secondly, you know, people criticize people for elected officials for being political where they're supposed to be political. That's their job. Their job is to represent their constituents. Hopefully they do more good than harm in exercising their political function. Uh, and I understand that in an era where unemployment is 4% and the economy is booming and the typical industries that generate jobs within a community, particularly in the, in the East, finance, banking, uh, insurance, uh, real estate, uh, they're the economic drive, manufacturing, they're economic drivers, not energy. Uh, when unemployment is 11% and the traditional drivers of employment uh, have diminished, uh, that poses, uh, frankly, a challenge. Uh, and people look to uh, areas to generate jobs that, that might not at first blush come to mind. Uh, and I, I'm a, as a supporter of states' rights, uh, I, I admire uh, elected officials' desire to employ their constituents. But at the same time, in some of these areas, particularly in an RPS, uh, where there is a mandate that the generation come from within the state, uh, that not only is a challenge, arguably under the Commerce Clause of the US Constitution, but is, uh, is more importantly for people in this room who study energy economics, uh, irrational in terms of finding the least cost solution uh, to the generation issue. Uh, and and is uh, ultimately if some of these some of these folks think that uh, particularly in the east with regard to the wind that they're going to get the next giant Vestas distribute or manufacturing uh, facility in their state and you can't have ten that you may not have one um, it, 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 I, I understand the urgency of the creation of jobs these projects, both the transmission system, necessary to deliver energy to market, as well as the generation facilities, uh, are, again, to repeat the point, 30 to 40 year assets. Uh, and they ought to be built on a firmer foundation than, well, we want to get some jobs created and unemployment is very high, so let's find a way to produce these jobs. I think in, in, I, would, I would look first to uh, the distribution system where you have a uh, smart grid and you have other opportunity to create jobs, plug in electric hybrid vehicles, and I'll discuss those later. I think those uh, will bear more immediate fruit at less risk to the ratepayers than the longer-lived generation and transmission projects. Uh, although, as again, as someone who believes in the federal system, uh, I'm certainly uh, supportive of state initiatives and believe strongly in states' rights. The issue of parochialism does present a challenge to implementation of federal energy policy. And I think everyone in the room who believes in economic rationality understands the origins of that, of that challenge. Uh, in terms of what FERC has been working on, um, we have rulemakings. Uh, one was just adopted in terms of a final rule on demand response, where we are treating demand response as a resource comparable to generation. Uh, and the, qu the question in that rulemaking was actually an interesting economic question, and there was an economic debate among the experts uh, as to the locational marginal price of, uh, in, if, uh, uh, which, which is a concept in the FERC-regulated markets that does not exist in the bilateral markets. So the rulemaking was limited to the FERC RTO markets. Uh, what is the level of compensation to be paid to demand response? Uh, and I will congratulate Chairman Wellinghoff on bringing this issue. This, is, this was his pet issue. There's no secret about that. And at the same time, even though it was his heart and soul issue, uh, he saw fit to uh, work with uh, his colleagues uh, very successfully and came up with a compromise proposal that, that compensated demand response at the locational marginal price with no reduction uh, for the hours in which there was economic benefits to the ratepayers. So it was, a, I think, a victory for the ratepayers, a victory of, for the environment, 
of course, of course, when we have uh, demand response called upon uh, to satisfy uh, load uh, through a, a reduction in load, uh, that is the equivalent of generation, only there are zero environmental costs associated with that uh, application of demand response. Uh, and so I think that was, uh, that was a major success. We have a rulemaking that is pending, uh, so it's in the stage of a notice of proposed rulemaking on integration of variable energy resources, which is sort of the code word for renewables. Uh, the challenges with renewables, of course, are uh, they're a variable resource, although if you wind and solar do pair well together. The wind is most effective uh, off of peak. Uh, two in the morning is when the wind blows the most. Uh, solar, of course, uh, disappears uh, when the sun is down. Uh, there are technologies that are increasingly available and increasingly economical. Uh, there's a project in Arizona that has molten salt storage. So the sun power is available uh, in, at 2 in the morning. Uh, and wind now has governors and regulators to back off when the wind gets too strong uh, and imposes a power uh, a stress on the grid, as well as uh, generation uh, storage uh, possibilities attendant to wind. Uh, so at 4 in the afternoon on the sultry summer day when the wind's not blowing, you're able to reserve power from the uh, uh, wind energy produced at 2 in the morning and apply that uh, to the grid. Uh, the use of plug-in electric vehicles uh, is another resource. Use the batteries as basically mobile mini storage facilities to store the wind that's blowing at 2 in the morning and, and preserve the economics uh, of, of the, the, uh, the economic efficiency of the capacity of the wind. So there are, there are many opportunities that are available. Uh, and as is the case with natural gas, we need the market to operate to send the price signals so that the innovators, so that the creators of ideas can implement their innovation to the marketplace in response to the price signals to, produ to produce the best economic environmental outcomes. Uh, but the regulatory environment has to adapt. One area in which we adapted recently was in the provision of regulation services. Uh, the grid has to be maintained at 60 hertz, not 59, not 61, 60. And there are resources that are available uh, and were available under prior law to provide a regulation service to keep the grid at 60. Uh, this, the so-called spinning reserve idea. This was historically done by fossil generation. There was a technology with flywheels that one company in particular is associated with, but there can be others and there can be new entrants into the market. But those uh, existing technology, those new technologies were not being adequately compensated. So FERC changed the rules for providing what were known as ancillary services to, to transmission to the grid to maintain the voltage at 60 hertz uh, in a more efficient, economical way. Uh, but again, government had to act, and we did act uh, last month in order to achieve that result. Uh, so again, it gets back to what is, what is the correct regulatory environment to send the appropriate price signals to the marketplace. And we can expect, if we send the correct price signals, uh, innovation to be the response. And the difficulty is these these goalposts will change over time. Uh, the, uh, we did not have the ability to send nanotechnology uh, in response to maintaining the, the 60 hertz to the grid 10 years ago. We didn't, that didn't exist three years ago. We don't know what the next greatest thing is going to be. And I don't want to be the one who decides what the next greatest thing is. That's not government's role. Government's role, I think, is to provide a open competitive framework. So whether it's uh, clean coal with carbon sequestration, whether it's uh, new forms of photovoltaic, whether it's uh, uh, solar thermal, uh, whether it's uh, natural gas, whether it's nuclear, uh, or uh, some uh, new form of hydropower. They've now got the, the Salt River Canals, uh, you know, idea of little micro turbines in the canals run to irrigate uh, uh, farm fields in Arizona as many uh, hydro facilities. Uh, so who knows what the next greatest idea is going to be? We have to keep an open mind. We have to be open uh, as regulators uh, to adapt to change circumstances. 
But again, the conundrum is, in, 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 as we change regulations, maintain the overriding concept of rule of law. Um, I think in terms of uh, the smart grid, uh, and I know there's going to be a discussion coming up on the smart grid, uh, there has not been, in my view, an adequate explanation uh, to the ratepayers of the benefits of the smart grid. Um, sometimes it's not, uh, it's not the merits of your arguments, it's how you serve it up. Uh, now, two anecdotes. One, uh, there are times when I win wonderful debates against my wife, and I end up sleeping in the garage. <laughs> and she says, it's not what you said, it's how you served it up. And then I got a phone call uh, about a year ago as Pacific Gas and Electric was rolling out the installation of its uh, smart meters. It was a gentleman from, I think it was Fresno, who said that he, was, he wanted to file a complaint with FERC, and he somehow found my name through a friend of a friend. Uh, and the advanced meter that Pacific Gas and Electric had installed in his house has, had caused his impotency and therefore wished to file a complaint with FERC. So I course I told him, I think you need to go to the California Public Utility Commission. But <laughs> and that's, that's uh, obviously it's a funny story and it's challenging for the company. For, and, the, and the company lawyer later said, I, we got that case and that cost us some legal fees to get rid of it. Uh, the company did not do a good job and they'll be the first to admit it uh, in explaining to the ratepayers what was what they were trying to achieve and just simply saying, this is stimulus money from the Department of Energy. Well, let's not, please. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? <laughs> uh, and it's being paid for by Uncle Sam, and so therefore you don't have to worry about it. And by the way, we get to fire a bunch of meter readers. Uh, that, that is, the answer is not eat your spinach. The answer to the smart grid is let's change the world. Because people do not like being hectored. That's the word I would use. And there is a tendency upon experts, people in government, people in the energy sector, to hector. I, that may be what your brother is getting at as the Tea Party person. Uh, I don't like, when I go to New York, I want to eat what I want to eat, okay? And I'm in pretty good shape. I worked out today. I'm, you know, thin guy, work out, good heart rate. I don't want Michael Bloomberg telling me what to eat when I go to New York, okay? I don't think he's, well, <laughs> I, it, is, it is an American concept to believe in individual choice, and we ought to be able to advert. To our, I'll use that word, advert, to our behavior. And if the smart grid is, you will get this meter and you will like it, and we will force you to do things that you don't want to do, that is government inter interposition in our personal lives that I think is at the heart of the very legitimate concerns the Tea Party has about the role of government. On the other hand, if it is an opt-in where you are, you are you, I, I th the meters need to be rolled out universally. But if it's explained that you have now the opportunity to control your energy usage, and if you, first of all, you have to have smart prices. In our RTO markets, I talked about the locational marginal price, the LMP. Arizona doesn't have smart prices. It's not a FERC-regulated market. It's a bilateral market. We don't have LMPs that tell you the, real, the price of electricity at 115 in the afternoon. We have average price. So we have stupid prices in Arizona. And the Arizona ratepayers don't get the full benefit of the smart meter you don't, you, no one can get the full benefit of a smart meter if you have a stupid price. If you have a smart price, you can say right now the cost of power is 25 cents because there's a run on the system. And we will allow you through the smart meter that tells you what the price is right now to curtail, uh, don't run the dishwasher, don't run the uh, clothes washer. Uh, we're going to cycle down the uh, air conditioner uh, and we will cycle back up when the price falls to six cents. And at the end of the day, here's a demonstration. It's the amount of money that you have saved. I think there are a lot of customers that would be very interested in this. My son, uh, bless his liberal soul, is very interested in the Google chip that goes in the refrigerator because he wants to be able to choose the 10 most environmentally friendly minutes that the refrigerator needs to cycle to keep the food cold. And he can ascertain that with a smart meter. There are lots of opportunities to get 
customers and ratepayers to advert to their the, 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 their interface with their consumption of energy, whether it's in the home or my son wants to know when the energy is coming from the wind that blows in the Shenandoahs, it's, it's going into the grid, or the sun that is shining that brings power to the grid in our, in our subdivision. That is extremely interesting to him. Cost is going to be very interesting to other folks. Uh, there are homeowners associations that I think are willing to aggregate their demand. Certainly the large industrial customers, the biggest industrial customers already have advanced meters. They already have time of use deals that they've cut with their utilities at their state commissions. I think that those opportunities ought to be available to smaller businesses, to commercial enterprises, uh, to law offices and accounting offices in downtown DC uh, to apply these uh, demand response uh, and cost savings opportunities. And they're only available if you have both smart meters and smart prices. And as we roll these out, that's the change the world as opposed to the eat your spinach uh, arguments. And I can tell you that the eat your spinach argument, my child will not eat spinach, and uh, the ratepayers in the United States will not adopt smart meter, it will not embrace smart meter technology as a means to achieve good environmental or economic outcomes if we do not have uh, uh, this, getting them to embrace uh, the meters as a, as a positive outcome. I want to leave time for questions, so I want to close with a little talk. And, uh, um, you know, I'm told that there's some litmus test issues with regard to, and uh, this, I guess, follows up a little bit on, shows great minds think alike, uh, Sarah's question uh, that she posed regarding whether you, you're, you're, it was about bas basically Nietzsche kind of nihilism existing in the political process where there's no interest in any type of legislation whatsoever because the political process has tied us, has tied us up, both left and right, and there are a lot to blame. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm a Republican, uh, so maybe there, maybe I'll do some more admissions on our, on our side. That, well, we have these litmus test issues, and you know, when I was running, I ran eight times for office, so you know, I've had to, I've had to do this, and I've heard the term litmus test, and typically it's, it's abortion and guns are the litmus test issues. So I thought about this, and so this morning, I got on the internet, and you know, I'm an old guy, but I can still do that, and litmus test arose. I used to test my pool, like Arizonans, we all have pools, and I would test the water every morning. And the old house we had on, uh, uh, on Harmont tended towards acid, so I had, to have, I had to add soda ash, and I would test the water at the Orangewood house that we bought in 93, uh, uh, and that would tend the other way, so I'd have to add the muriatic acid. And it, But litmus test is a term that originated in 1952, and it was a strip of paper, and it was to test of a solution. Could be water, could be anything. A drop was, a, was put on the, on, the, on the paper, and that would determine whether the solution was acidic or alkaline. It was a one-shot deal, okay? And in terms of litmus test in other contexts, it is a crucial and revealing test in which there is one decisive factor, okay? So there can't be 50 litmus tests, I, don't you think? You, you, there are certain things, if you're a hardcore Republican primary voter, you're into. There are certain things, if you're a hardcore Democrat primary voter, obviously you're into, and that's, that's fine, that's well and good. But I, I, it's hard for me, under this definition, and somebody who's run for office a bunch of times, to, to, to adduce that there is a litmus test over compact fluorescent lights. I, I, uh, that's, I think the members of the U.S. House, if they, if they like them, they can vote for them. If they don't like them, they don't have to vote for them. They, they exercise, as Edmund Burke would say, their own judgment. But I don't think there's a group of, on the Tea Party right or on the Democrat left that has imposed a litmus test issue one way or the other on CFLs. I think these guys can actually vote their conscience. And in terms of voting your conscience, um, it was a rough year for Tucson. My former chief of staff at the Arizona Commission uh, and came to, preceded me actually in Washington, D.C. to set up my office, uh, is an attorney, a U of A graduate, and he went back to Tucson to take a position with Tucson Electric Power. And uh, he called me one Saturday afternoon 
and uh, Gabby Giffords is a friend of mine, and uh, said that she had been shot, and he had, acting on a, a bad press report, uh, said that she had been killed. And he was actually going to go to that event. His boss was, a, was, her, was her finance committee chairman. And uh, because he had a cold that day, he didn't, he didn't go. And I went down to my basement. I'm a lawyer and a pack rat, and I save everything. I, uh, stuff my wife wishes I would get rid of. Why is this football from 1972 still needed in our house? But I went through my, my files, and I found uh, in, that, in the last campaign that I ran a con campaign contribution from, from Gabby Giffords with a little sticky note that said, Go Mark, with Mark spelled with a C correctly. And I thought, that's kind of cool. You know, she's a Democrat. And... Uh, I, and we had we had a number of dealings, and I, I'll compress my long story into into saying that she we worked well together, uh, and she showed always showed a lot of uh, grace under pressure, and particularly when some of her colleagues were irritated with uh, w in the Democrat caucus in the state Senate were irritated with the Arizona Commission. We were always able to get get down and work it out without one single exception. We resolved our issues harmoniously and on a bipartisan basis with the goal to do the right thing for the people that we, we both represented. And uh, I heard this later from a lawyer when I spoke with in Phoenix. You know, I'm still upset about this. He said, you know, you need to, you need to hear a story, Spitz. Um, the chairman of the Democratic Party called Gabby and said, you know, we're trying to run somebody against, we're trying to find somebody to run against Mark Spitzer. And this is 06, this is before the White House called. And it's not easy. And you going out and writing a campaign contribution to him is not helping. Okay? And her answer was interesting. And I, I heard this third hand, so, but I, I have no doubt it's true. I, Don, I appreciate what you've done for the Arizona Democratic Party and the support you've given to me in my prior races and the support you've given me and the support I anticipate in future races. And I congratulate you and thank you. And I have to say, though, your job is to elect Democrats to office. My job is to represent the people of my district. And I think the people of my district are best served by Mark Spitzer being in the Arizona Commission. And this is the type of thing you, you hear the negative and are bombarded by the negative. And so I just urge you maybe to step back. And there's a lot in this town and throughout the country of people who are very interested. Energy is a front-burning issue, and there are a lot of people that are, are, in my view, very attentive to this issue. That like, and Gabby Giffords is a unique person of great intelligence and courage. But there are a lot of people that think the way she does, that do not act based on partisan politics, but, are act, based, but act based on their motivation to do the best possible thing they can do to represent their constituents whether it be energy or any other issue. And I th my suspicion is, although it's not necessarily newsworthy or noteworthy, that is a lot found a lot more in our political dialogue, in our political lives, than you might first assume. Uh, so with that, uh, I thank you and be very pleased to take your questions. All right, let me uh, please once again remind everybody uh, what the rules are here. Wait for the microphone. Uh, secondly, tell us who you are. And third, uh, please put a question mark at the end of your statement. <laughs> All right. Questions, please. Uh, Mark, in the background there. There we go. Mark Breifogel. I'm with a small hedge fund and I do some engineering R&D. Uh, despite Adam's admonition, I want to applaud your stance on the sanctity of contracts as an investor picking the babies out of the bathwater post Enron and looking at who had contracts to offset debt and then to see all those contracts challenged was a, uh, it did not help my purse. Um, there was no, <laughs> by the way, there was no political benefit to my predecessors at FERC, both Republican and Democrat, for standing up for sanctity of contract. All the, pol all the politics was the other way. And those were very courageous decisions by my predecessors, and I'm proud that they were affirmed by the United States Supreme Court as lawful. So was I, but it took eight years. <laughs> it's not a criticism. Um, 
I'm interested in the distributed generation field. Uh, typical of all conferences, we had 180 minutes of discussion and maybe 15 seconds of distributed generation. It did appear there once. I understand that Commissioner Wellinghoff is very interested in it. You mentioned little turbines in, in the canals. Uh, what's FERC's attitude legally, and are you doing things like recommending to the DOE that they fund research in uh, distributed generation? I was at a conference last night, MIT, local club for entrepreneurs, and that's 90% biologists. Uh, it's hard to go find an RFP for distributed generation. Please inform. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think it's our role to go to DOE and, and seek funding uh, for particular technologies. What our role is to create a, a good regulatory framework. And DOE has, and there are folks here from DOE that I'm, I'm respectful, and they're, I think they're perfectly capable to do th what they need to do without our assistance. But uh, I'd advise you to take a look at um, two cases. One is called Western Grid, and the other case is called Primary Power. And I won't get deeply into the merits. I, I think these, one of, the, one of the two might be under rehearing as I speak, but the question is uh, on an application for treatment as a transmission resource that's eligible for uh, compensation uh, as a FERC-regulated transmission asset uh, and potentially for incentive uh, ROE adders under Section 219 of the Federal Power Act were distributed resources and, or storage resources eligible. And in both cases, FERC said yes. Uh, a storage facility can be treated as generation, can be treated as transmission. Uh, it's, it's, complica it's complicated. It's not a power line attached to poles. But we granted the applications in both cases under the theory that we wanted to provide a regulatory framework that allowed new innovative technologies to compete in the marketplace. Unanimous decisions, I think correct decisions, I'm, if I may humbly suggest, uh, that allowed uh, the entity to choose how it would be compensated. Now, of course, generation would have to compete, would go out and get a PPA with the, with the local utility. This entity, these entities chose to participate as transmission assets. I think the FERC transmission compensation metric is very positive. That's one area where there is actually some debate at FERC and some di respectful disagreement as to the application of Section 219 of the Federal Power Act. I got to tell you, I support what Congress tried to do in 05, Senator Bingaman and Senator Domenici, and they wanted to provide an, an enhanced return to an area that had been neglected because transmission is 10 percent of the business of the utilities, and it was retarding the 90 percent of the remainder of the business, including renewables. And as we know, renewable resources are not located near load. They're lo winds is lo wind blows where it blows. Sun shines where it shines, not necessarily in the load pockets. We need high voltage transmission to get these resources to load. And we got steel in the ground as a, as a consequence of the enhanced ROEs pursuant to uh, the FERC rule and FERC, individual FERC orders in cases. And I will not apologize for getting infrastructure and steel on the ground to the benefit of the ratepayers. Yes, sir. Roger Wall, is this, is this on? Roger Wallace, uh, Pioneer Natural Resources. Um, we talked a lot about get natural gas this morning. I'm wondering uh, what the FERC's position is going to be on uh, the exportation of LNG, which is becoming a major uh, topic in our industry. Well, we have two uh, applications in front of us, so I, I can't comment. I don't want to prejudge those cases. Uh, and I, I really can't say any more. There have been interventions filed. And there's, there's debate. So wait and see. I'll, I'm sure I'll issue a, a good opinion on that. Mm -hmm. I want to be mindful of my judicial role. Uh, Michael. Michael Wyman. I'm Canadian. And I, I, I'm necessarily not, not as familiar with the U.S. regulatory framework as perhaps I could be if I were from here. But I, I sometimes wonder why 
in the U.S., it seems that uh, states, state regulatory bodies in particular, can effectively impede things that I, I would have thought the, the interstate commerce clause of the Constitution was designed to promote things like M&A that would affect synergies across regional boundaries, um, things like transmission that would uh, enable transportation of electricity across regional boundaries. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit, just even from a legal perspective, about whether those problems are um, constitutional in nature, number one. And secondly, to the extent they're not constitutional in nature, why and whether this might change, why Congress has not passed legislation that would enable FERC or a federal body to, to get past those obstacles? A very interesting question. Your, your view as to the applicability of the Commerce Clause uh, over with respect to state preferences shows a great deal more intellectual acuity than many U.S. politicians. <laughs> uh, it, no, and, and I'm, being, I'm being facetious, but there was, a, there was a strong debate in Arizona when we did our RPS as to whether the RPS should be restricted to source in Arizona. And it was a three to two vote, and the two dissenting colleagues of mine on the Arizona Commission didn't disagree with my Commerce Clause argument. They just said, this is about politics, and I want to create jobs in Arizona. And, you know, labor organizations were supporting the in-state sourcing, uh, and that was, uh, that's, there's, there's, oftentimes in life there's a clash between law and politics, and it's, it's not surprising that it arose in this context, and particularly as I, when I was discussing parochialism, back then, the unemployment rate in Arizona because of the booming real estate economy was close to zero, real unemployment. Now, obviously, it's much higher, and I don't know if that vote would come out the same way under, under this current circumstances of high unemployment th that they would then. We have, for better or worse, in our country, also in Canada, you know, the FERC has more authority than the National Energy Board because in Canada, there, there's, a lot, there's a great degree of, of provincial authority, provincial in the good sense, uh, uh, authority over regulation of, uh, of electricity, uh, and the states oftentimes can be very innovative, uh, and where states have good policies, they, there tends to be more investment than in those states that, that lack the good policies, and that, that's, a, that's something to be commended. So I'm, I remain a states' rights guy. On the other hand, the, we need an interstate grid. We have an interstate highway system. There were winners and losers when the interstate highway system was built, okay? There, old Route 66 in northern Arizona, you know, there were some economic losers attendant to when I-40 went in. Uh, and when we build out the transmission grid, there are winners and losers, and there are some entities that benefit from the current inadequate status of the grid. Those who have generation in constrained areas are getting more. Those locational marginal prices are higher than they would be had we had a fully robust grid. So I understand that there's some perceive it as a zero-sum game. I think that's unfortunate that that, that is the perception. Uh, I don't, I'm not entirely sure it's the reality. Uh, and then there are um, the forces I alluded to earlier with regard to the historical origin of the electric grid, which was you had a local monopoly that was franchised that derived all of its generation from which, within the franchise monopoly service territory, and the transmission lines were needed only to get the generation from within the monopoly franchise to the customers within the monopoly franchise. Compared with what FERC did, what Congress did in 1992, and what FERC did in Order 888 in 1996, which was open up the transmission grid to have the transmission grid now transmit energy on a most efficient basis across the country, across multiple service territories, and potentially through thousands of miles of geography in order to get the best outcome, both in terms of environmental and in terms of economic. And we're asking the electricity grid to do far more today than it's ever done in the past. Uh, and the, you know, the, the forces are aligned against transmission because there's no natural constituency for transmission. Transmission that traverses thousands of miles engenders political opposition from those in its path. The longer the line, the more the opposition. Uh, and so it is a huge challenge uh, and in some respects, given the political hostility 
and the structural barriers, it's amazing that we've gotten the transmission in this country that we have. But Congress recognized that there was this delict. So Congress in 05 enacted Section 219. I spoke about the enhanced ROEs. Congress also enacted uh, Section 216, which is the federal backstop siting authority that I alluded to earlier that has been somewhat eviscerated by two adverse decisions from the courts of appeal. I think there needs to be some federal siting authority. Let me say, uh, when I was in Arizona, we cited every power line application that came before us. It might not have been the same route that the applicant chose. We, we chose different routes based on the facts. We had a legal proceeding, and we wanted to uh, impact the environment and impact our constituents to the least degree possible, but we cited the lines. In most states, the state commissions do a very good job of citing power lines. There are two problems. One is where power is being proposed to transmit it from state A to state C and state B is the intermediary. State B may not have much of a NIMBY problem nor great objection to the siting of the line, but under state law, in many cases, they have to show a benefit to that state. And where power is going from A to C, you cannot show a benefit to state B, so it, it would be problematic for that commission from a legal point of view to sustain the line. In that case, you may need some federal backstop authority. The other circumstance is, what, for whatever reason, the political process is simply just broken down. And, and the state is not capable of doing the right thing. I think if there were a federal backstop authority that was real, I think the state commissions, and I really think this is the very, very small minority of cases, but even in that small minority of cases, the state commission would say, look, we know it's politically unpopular to cite this line. We prefer not to do it, but we really don't want people in Washington citing the line for us. They're not sensitive to our local needs and issues, um, so let's do it ourselves. So it's sort of a, the mutual assured destruction theory of, uh, from the 50s, uh, sort of compelling folks to do what they, what they probably should know they should do and should have done initially. So I do think there should be more federal citing authority. But beyond that, we have to come to grips with the view, as I said earlier, that electricity is a commodity. There are some folks that don't accept that view that have an unduly parochial view of the world. And th with things like the smart grid, people figure out, hey, we have some real opportunities here where wind is blowing in the upper Midwest or offshore in the Atlantic. We can harness that capability, but we're going to need power lines. And the electrons don't understand this concept of state borders. They flow in accordance with you know, electrical engineering principles. That's, that's where we need to head. Commissioner Spitzer, I've got a question for you. It's a follow-up, actually, on the Canadian thing, and it's not before the FERC, so I think maybe you might be able to comment on it, and it touches on your, your key points about markets, infrastructure, rule of law, the Commerce Clause, parochialism, and that is uh, TransCanada Pipeline has proposed to build a very big oil pipeline from Alberta down through uh, North and South Dakota through Oklahoma, picking up U.S. oil along the way and delivering it to Texas where it could be refined. And we seem to be having a terrible time uh, finding the political will to, to approve the permits for this infrastructure project, which touches on a lot of these issues that you talked about. I wonder if you could comment on that. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the project. It's obviously not in my bailiwick, and I, I don't like to kibitz, as it were. Uh, <laughs> Ultimately, you have to balance comp government. Well, government is about balancing competing interests. Life is not so simple, and that's why the the, the concept of litmus tests. And may, maybe in our mind, we have litmus tests. I like to think people vote for elected officials based on qualities of the candidates. You know, maybe I'm naive. Um, the adherence to very rigid litmus tests precludes government from balancing the competing interests, and the competing interests are in the case of that proposed oil pipeline, uh, the economic benefits to the consumers of the United States balance against the environmental impacts of the line. And I don't know if the line maybe should be built, maybe should not. I'm not, I'm not frankly familiar with the circumstances, but if we, if we adhere to a rigid litmus test, which is no energy anywhere, and there's some, there's some folks on the far left who don't like any form of energy. And they, it's sort of a Spartan self-flagellation. They want to create very high rates to 
to diminish consumption, and it's a punitive. And I, I think the overwhelming majority of progressives reject that view. And then there's, there's a Republican extremism, which is build anything anywhere, and we don't care. We're indifferent to environmental consequences. And I think the overwhelming majority of conservatives reject that view. And though, so if, if we reject the litmus test and are able to focus on a very analytical balancing of the competing interests, the impact on the environment versus the benefits to the ratepayers, you, although I agree reasonable minds may disagree, that's the proper framework for that decision. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, Paul McCardle, DOE slash EIA. I had a quick question. You mentioned a uh, FERC rulemaking on demand response yes. based on local marginal prices. In implementing that, how do you get around the jurisdiction of the, the state commissions? It's a wholesale. It's a determination at the wholesale level. We're not making a determination at the retail level. So we've preserved, the, we expressly preserve the authorities of the states. And so the demand response bids that go in in the wholesale markets Demand response can bid in as a resource in New England ISO, to take one example. The bid would be cleared at the locational marginal price, and assuming the net benefits test is met and the resource is comparable to generation, they would pay, they, the demand response bidder would receive the locational marginal price as opposed to the opposition in the pleadings which asked for the locational marginal price minus the cost of the generation. So that was the that was the decision that we had to make in that case. It was not an easy. It was a very interesting case, but it, it's one that I think ultimately would benefit will benefit the ratepayers. That was a quick question and a quick answer. So let's do one more. Mark, why don't you finish off for us? I'm Mark Lively. That's with a K. My late wife used to say the way the sexy way to spell it was is with a C. So, um, but time I've been called sexy. What? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> may, may, maybe it's that I, I feel that I'm safe enough where I am with uh, in spelling with a K. Um, you you had said that electricity flows where it wants to flow, and needs, and you gave the example of tra building transmission line from state A to state C. Well. Sometimes you have not just state B in the way, but also state D. And I'm thinking about the huge ISO markets, MISO and PJM, which are east-west highways. And just south of that, you have t the Tennessee Valley Authority, which provides some wheeling path for that east-west highway. Is there some way to compensate TVA for the path that it's providing? Are you talking about a new line? I'm trying to understand your hypothetical. No, existing lines. It's providing parallel path flow for the line, say, for a transaction from Chicago to uh, New Jersey. Some of that electricity will flow through TVA. Is there a way to compensate TVA? I, be I believe under the tariffs as currently exist, TVA is compensated. So you're, you, and you, you are and you should be compensated for the power flowing across your, your lines. So I believe that's the status quo. All right. Uh, so closing out, uh, Commissioner Spitzer, on behalf of Spartans, Macedonians, readers of Nietzsche, and all of us <laughs> <laughs> at uh, CSIS and the NCAC, we'd like to thank you very much and present you with this certificate of appreciation. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>